Okay. All right, meeting participants. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So we're talking about Miss C, as it's as it's pronounced, right? Um, That's correct. So what what is Miss C, and has it was it a, around even before COVID nineteen? Yeah, that's a great question. So first, let's break down what Miss C stands for. Um, so it's M I S hyphen C, um, but it stands for a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. So it's obviously quite a mouthful. So we shorten that by saying Miss C. Um, and this is something that has been described in the COVID ban pandemic, and actually in the little bit of the later spring and early summer as cases of COVID-19 really surged in Europe, um, in the East Coast of the United States, and then in the Midwest. So it is something that is unique to COVID-19 in children, much more so than in adults. Um, but you know, for those of us who are in the field, uh, this inflammatory syndrome does have some similarities to other severe viral infections that children can get, but in the era of the COVID-19 pandemic, this was an emerging phenomenon um, that really, uh, appropriately so, many uh, investigators and physicians from large children's hospitals that were seeing a number of these cases got very public about talking about this because it's so important to diagnose it and recognize and treat so that we can give children the absolute best outcomes. Okay, and so what, um... What are some of the symptoms of it? What should parents be looking out for? Yeah, so Missy, unfortunately, is pretty vague uh, to uh, the naked eye and can look a whole lot like other illnesses and conditions. So I think having some awareness about the warning signs of what to look out for is really important. And by no means do I mean to say that if your child has these symptoms, they will have Missy. But I think especially given the rapid increase of COVID-19 that we've seen um, that we've seen in our community um, over the past month and a half. I think it should be on our minds because really the trigger of this inflammatory syndrome is a COVID-19 infection in a child. So the symptoms that are most common that we see with children who have Miss C, first of all, is fever. A fever that can last anywhere from one to two to three days, even a little bit longer. Um, and a very common symptom that we're seeing of children and of all age groups is diarrhea. Um, so frequent, watery, looser bowel movements. That often comes along with abdominal pain and cramping, sometimes vomiting, and usually a pretty poor appetite. Um, not all children have had diarrhea as they've come in with Missy, but that is a very prominent feature that we've seen in many patients in the, in the, um, in the state of Michigan. Some other features that you can see, um, a rash, and it really can be any sort of rash. It could look like a sunburn, which obviously we don't see a whole lot of sunburns in the middle of, of November in the state of Michigan. So anything that looks like a sunburn, red splotches on the body, um, raised red bumps, any of those things that are just abnormal appearances on your skin in the setting of fever, again, should make you think about this. And then there's some other things that can be observed um, to the naked eye, like uh, a red coloration to the whites of your eyes, um, a change to the way your lips look, maybe your lips looking more red, maybe even cracked or puffy. Um, and then also enlargement of the glands in the neck. Um, now again, not all of those things are universal, but um, in the current era where we are seeing so much more COVID-19, both adults and children, um, if you have your child who you know had COVID, had a close contact that was COVID, or maybe an illness that never got diagnosed with COVID because they didn't get tested, but made you concerned about it, and then you develop the fever, potentially diarrhea, rash, any of those other things really would warrant you to call your pediatrician and talk about the next steps and evaluation. So how many cases have we seen at Helen Voss Children's Hospital? Yeah, that's a great question. And we've seen a total of 10 children at the Children's Hospital who have been diagnosed with Miss C. And this is going back as early as April up to the present moment. So 10 children over the course of several months is not a lot, but we do have concern with the amount of COVID in our community that we will be seeing more children with Missy in the coming months. 
And is there a, a treatment readily available or do you have to sort of try what works? Right, so MIS-C, if it's suspected or diagnosed, um, is a condition that is treated in the hospital environment. Unfortunately, if, if you are diagnosed with having this, this does mean coming into the children's hospital for an inpatient admission. And the treatments are actually variable depending on, on what the child needs. So the basic thing that almost all children with MIS-C will need is what we call supportive care. And what supportive care means is providing any sort of support, whether that be intravenous hydration, electrolyte replacement, or any sort of support for breathing, whether it be oxygen or providing some pressurized breathing to help support the child's body. Because what happens with MIS-C um, is that there's this really intense inflammatory process that goes on in the child's body, and it can impair the way some of our vital organs function. So I mentioned very commonly we see diarrhea as a presenting symptom of MIS-C, so almost all children are going to need some intravenous fluids. And sometimes we need to support the blood pressure as well if the child becomes very dehydrated or if their inflammatory state is really quite severe. So it's very common to need intravenous fluids. And then some children do need respiratory support as well. So that's kind of the, the basal needs that most children with MIS-C are going to have. And then after supporting or while supporting the, the child's body, then we also provide medications to help um, quiet down that intense inflammatory response that is really quintessential for MIS-C. So that includes anti-inflammatory medications. Some, some people have heard of like steroid therapy as an option. There are other medications, um, one of which called intravenous gamma globulin or IVIG. And then there are other targeted medications that are given, again, intravenously, that can help target the really overreactive inflammatory response in the child's body that's causing the illness to begin with. Is this something where the um, convalescent plasma can help? Or do you have to have an active COVID-19 infection in order for that to work? That's a wonderful question. So there are a handful of different treatments that are available to treat acute respiratory COVID-19. And you mentioned one of them, Val. One of them is convalescent plasma, which is a plasma donated by somebody who has a known prior COVID-19 infection. And giving that antibody can help neutralize the active infection of COVID-19. There are other medicines as well, monoclonal antibodies, which we've heard about, um, antivirals such as remdesivir, and then certain steroids that we give also to treat acute respiratory COVID. Now it gets kind of complicated because you can actually, you, like I said before, almost all MIS-C is post-infectious inflammatory syndrome. So you have actually recovered from that infection um, and then you have an inflammatory process afterwards. Now there are actually a small subset of patients who will develop MIS-C while they still have active respiratory viral syndrome, COVID-19. So there can be a little bit of crossover as you're still having symptom, respiratory symptoms and then you evolve into MIS-C. In that case then, you both wanna treat the virus in most cases, either with an antiviral, convalescent plasma, uh, but then also helping to address the really exaggerated, harmful inflammatory response that the body undergoes. So those patients are quite complicated and you have to treat kind of two things at the same time, well, the active infection and the inflammatory response. But most patients are actually in the post-infectious inflammatory process where you're really then targeting just the inflammation and the active COVID infection is not actually there anymore. And is it true then that you can actually um, get MIS-C after you've recovered, weeks after you've recovered? Yes, that's absolutely true. The, um, there's a pretty wide um, time from infection to when you develop MIS-C. The usual range is between two to eight weeks after you've had the initial COVID-19 infection. Um, of course, there's gonna be an, a, a couple outliers either way, but two to eight weeks is, is the usual time frame that you would see MIS-C develop. And you can't really pinpoint which child might develop it and which child might not. Yes, and that's part of the difficulty is that we don't know, oh. very rarely some children will develop MIS-C, whereas the vast majority of children actually recover beautifully from COVID-19, some with very mild to even no symptoms of COVID-19. So at this point, unfortunately, we don't know what the cause is. There's suspicion that there could be a genetic um, predisposition to this condition. We just don't know what it is yet. And we see that MIS-C happens in normal, healthy people. 
of both genders, all races, and all ages of children as well. So we really have to keep an open mind at this point until we get more precise information. And one of the main concerns is that MISTI can, um, can really attack a lot of the organs, but mostly 80% the heart. Yes. That, of course, is the feared complication of MISC. I mean, there's all of your vital organs are called vital organs for reasons. They all serve a very important function um, for your body, whether that be your lungs, your heart, your liver, your kidneys. And really, at the Children's Hospital, we have a multidisciplinary team that addresses all of those different aspects of MISC. Speaking specifically to the heart issues that come along with MISC, um, you can bundle those into two main buckets. There's the function of the heart muscle itself, the one that squeezes blood out to the rest of the body. And then there are the arteries around the heart that provide blood to that muscle. So you have the muscular function and then you have the coronary arteries. And either of those, and sometimes both, can be affected by Miss C. So if, you have a, if we have a child who comes to the hospital who has Miss C, even if they seem very stable, we're, we're still going to image the heart to assess the function and the health of those coronary arteries. And sometimes we need to follow that function and those arteries very closely with the help of our cardiologists. Um, the good news is, is that even though the uh, impact on the heart can be quite marked in the moment, with appropriate treatment, these children recover their heart function very nicely. And then we follow them for quite a period of time after they leave the hospital to make sure their coronary arteries um, can get down to normal size and remain healthy. And do we know yet the long-term effects of MIS-C? We don't, we don't. And we're keeping a very open mind. Um, just as we think about an adult who has had any sort of issue with their coronary arteries, whether they have cholesterol buildup or we have a known occlusion of one of those coronary arteries, we follow them for quite a long time. Um, similar to that would be our children with Miss C. We are likely going to have to follow them for quite a long period of time because we don't know yet. We're literally living through this as it's evolving. So I would assume that they will need long-term cardiology follow-up. Even if everything returns to normal, we still want to follow those coronary arteries over time. So that will really evolve. But for the time being, if you're diagnosed with COVID-19 and then develop Miss C, Yes, we'll be following them um, with our uh, wonderful cardiology team for a long period of time. And I know we don't have a lot of uh, information and statistics, but one thing that I did find is that uh, at least during this period of time that we're seeing these cases, more males than females are getting it. Do we know why? No, and unfortunately, because we don't, again, know exactly the reason why MISC develops uh, in general, we don't know why there may be a slight um, predilection for one gender over the other. Um, at our children's hospital, again, we've only seen 10 children, but it's been pretty evenly split between males and females. So that may vary a bit depending on what center you're talking to, but unfortunately we don't have an explanation for why that is the case. Okay. And there seems to be a sweet spot between um, five and 14 to get this particular type of Miss C. Yep, there is, there's definitely an age range. Um, at our children's hospital, we've seen seven to, I'm sorry, three to 17 years of age. Um, and actually our youngest patient, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll uh, edit that comment. We've seen down to age two. So our age range here is two to 17. So some areas of the country have seen more teens um, who have been affected. Some have seen more young children. Um, and that goes for the European countries have, who have reported data as well. There's quite a large age range. So I can't really say that one group is, is more at risk than others, um, because here, of course, we've seen the whole, the whole gamut. Um, and I do also want to note that although this is called Miss C, and the C means children, there is also a phenomenon called Miss A, which is the same exact thing, but in adults, and far fewer numbers than what we've seen in children, but this actually has been reported in some young adults as well. Oh, wow. Okay. So something else to watch out for as we head into yeah. these winter months, for sure. Yes, absolutely. And it, it, it seems to follow a very similar um, clinical progression, as I described before, with the adults. Luckily, adults much less so um, than what we've seen in pediatrics in terms of the numbers. Okay. Is there anything we didn't cover that you think is um, important for parents to know? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I say this often when, when we talk, and I want to just reiterate it, you know, once again, that you know, for parents to trust your instincts. And if you've had a known case of COVID in your household, if your child have it, but even put that aside, I mean, there's so much COVID in our community right now, 
that if your child does have a new illness with that fever, diarrhea, rash, or just doesn't look well, and it just isn't acting like themselves, always trust your gut instinct. You're never going to regret calling your pediatrician's office to get some advice. And if it's after hours and you don't have someone you can talk to, um, our emergency department is very well equipped to assess these patients and do the initial uh, investigation to see if it could possibly be Miss C. Again, it doesn't mean that your child is going to be diagnosed, but we really want people to keep an open mind and follow their gut instincts. Um, you'd rather be safe than sorry as we're learning more and more about this condition. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, we are really at a, a moment in West Michigan where COVID-19 continues to increase. We're heading into the months of the year where we're seeing all sorts of other illnesses that commonly come onto the scene as well. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, children have done very well when it comes to COVID-19. Yes, Miss C is a very rare phenomenon, but it's very, very important that we don't have children unnecessarily get infected with the novel coronavirus because we certainly don't uh, want any child to have to suffer through Miss C. Um, so I think it's just one extra push for trying to protect our, our community, help, uh, you know, preserve the health of our children um, and get through this viral respiratory season together. Hey, that's all I had. Great. Thank you so much. Well, wow, that was like the most detailed interview.